uh, tell you a story today that um, reflects, uh, that focuses mostly on research from my own lab, but at the same time, that has implications for the kinds of work that I want to try to foster as a director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, just real quick on that note, uh, National Institute of Mental Health is the premier, uh, the primary agency of the federal government that supports mental health related research. Uh, we have a $1.6 billion portfolio, 3,000 uh, grants at any one time across the United States, as well as a vigorous research program intramurally at the NIH. And so I feel some obligation to tell you a little bit broader story than just my own work. Uh, but at the same time, I know that uh, it's always fun to talk specifics in science, so I'll, I'll focus on my work. But before I do that, I want to just give you, if you will, uh, uh, some of my own thoughts about the challenges and opportunities that we face in mental health research, and I'm sure some of it will be familiar uh, to, to, to all of you. Um, and then I'll launch into two different stories from my lab, uh, one in which we tried to use a genetic predisposition factor to uh, schizophrenia in particular uh, to understand how genes al could alter behaviors, but from a focus on what effects those genes have at the level of neural circuits. And I'll explain a little bit more about that along the way. Um, and then I want to tell you a second story, which delves a little more deeply into the function of uh, neural circuits over time uh, to illustrate a point that the dynamics of changes in t uh, over time in a particular neural circuit actually matter for behavior. And then I want to think more broadly about the lessons we learn from those two stories in terms of trying to understand how we might use uh, neural circuit uh, information that we gain about uh, the function of the nervous system from neural circuit approaches to develop uh, novel treatment approaches in, in patients. Uh, okay, so challenges and opportunities. Um, so again, the, the NIMH major, uh, F, um, it, the major focus is on research, and in particular, our research is aimed at transforming the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses through basic and clinical research, paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. And that's a really a tall ask, and it's a tall ask for several reasons, um, uh, the challenges that we face in mental illness. And the first and foremost we must acknowledge is the tremendous burden of mental illnesses uh, to both individuals and families and society at large. Uh, this plot here I'm showing you is the prevalence at any moment in time, the percentages of adults in the United States who are suffering from a diagnosable mental illness. And uh, it, it's about one in five adults. One in five adults at any moment in time will be, will be suffering from a diagnosable mental illness, slightly higher in women than in men, um, across the age spectrum and across the spectrum of ethnicities. So no one is immune from mental illness uh, in the US. There's one other feature on this graph that I wanna particularly point out, and that is the high prevalence, particularly in young people. So mental illness strikes young, typically, uh, 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 in adolescence and early adulthood. And unfortunately, mental illnesses are, are uh, as a rule, chronic illnesses that persist throughout life. And so that means that the burden to society is tremendous. Because, of course, uh, that 20% figure means 20% suffering disability throughout life. The second aspect of, uh, of challenge that we face in mental illness research is trying to understand just what kinds of mental illnesses there are out there in the world. Our diagnostic system is, frankly, terrible. It is useful for many, many reasons. Um, it's useful for shorthand for doctors to talk to each other. It's useful for insurance companies to bill for patient sessions, but in terms of trying to understand what goes wrong in the brains of individuals who are suffering from psychiatric disorders or what risk factors give rise, our diagnostic systems are terrible. One of the reasons why that is true is shown on this slide, um, which uh, is for children, but the same, uh, pretty much the same diagram would apply to adults. And on this slide is illustrated the percentage of individuals who present to uh, a uh, mental health clinic, uh, the percentage of children who qualify for a given psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, in black, for example, is the percentage of children who present to a clinic complaining of a psychiatric complaint 
Um, about 30% of them will be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. About 45% of them will be diagnosed with a substance abuse disorder. About 46% will be diagnosed with ADHD or another behavioral disorder. About 26% will be diagnosed with affective disorder. You've already noticed that we've gone way above 100%. Why? Because these diagnoses end up, when you do it on an individual by individual basis, being tremendously overlapping, so that the rule is not a single diagnosis for a given patient, but actually, on average, three diagnoses per child coming into a mental health clinic. It is possible that each and every one of those children really has three different things wrong with their brain that result in three different behavioral syndromes. But I would argue that it is much more likely that, on average, a child has one thing wrong with their brain that has multiple behavioral consequences, um, but we don't know how to categorize it well. So we face a challenge in the heavy burden. We face a challenge in our relative, uh, uh, the relative um, uh, poorness of our diagnoses. And we also face a challenge in terms of biomarkers. Biomarkers are laboratory tests or uh, behavioral tests or other things that we can read out from a human being that tell us something about what kind of disease they have, where in the course of that illness they might be, uh, whether they're going to respond to a particular treatment and or uh, whether they are responding, how their disease changes over time. Uh, this is one example of a biomarker in Alzheimer's disease. These are brain scans from individuals with uh, either normal cognition or abnormal cognition. And the red colors indicate the degree to which there is amyloid protein found deposited in their brain by this brain scan. And what you find is that as, in, as individuals with Alzheimer's dementia progress in the severity of their illness, you get a larger and larger burden of amyloid deposition in their brain. And you can detect this while they are alive using a brain scan. Um, we have no such biomarkers in psychiatry, zero. Right? We have many things which we think might be predictive, but we have yet to develop a biomarker that is compelling enough that, it would, that physicians would find it useful in guiding treatment or in informing their patients about what to expect with their disorder. And so we have a high burden, difficulty with diagnoses, no biomarkers, and now treatments. Treatments we think of as the thing that we've got the best handle on in psychiatry, right? When I was training in, in medical school and I was trying to decide between psychiatry and neurology, what did I hear from everybody? I heard, well, neurology, they know exactly what's wrong and they don't know how to fix it. In psychiatry, they know how to fix everything, but they don't know how it, it, how, what's wrong. <laughs> Both of those statements are inaccurate today, right? In that neurologists actually have a lot of treatments at their disposal, and psychiatrists know more and more about the brain. But the other reason why it's, it's, uh, um, it's not so accurate is our treatments don't work so well. And that's the dirty little secret of psychiatry. Not so secret anymore, probably not so dirty either. But, um, so this is an example from a very large community-based study that the NIMH uh, carried out, funded and carried out, uh, some time ago from the initial publications in 2010, of uh, different antidepressants, seeing in the community, if you gave antidepressants, how well did people do? And if you take a bunch of patients with depression and give them antidepressants, about a third of them will respond to the first antidepressant that they get. And if you then, if they don't respond, you switch into another one, another 20% or so. If they don't respond, you switch into another one. You go through four different antidepressant treatments, and about two-thirds of patients will respond to those treatments, which means, of course, that one-third will not. Right? So now there are other treatments that weren't tried here that maybe are slightly more effective, um, but the bottom line is that our antidepressants work only about two-thirds of the time. Moreover, when they work, they don't last. So this is a plot of those same patients who went through these four different steps. So in one here is the patients who responded to the first drug, two who responded to the second, et cetera, and asking how long will it be until those patients have a relapse. And what you find is that by one year after starting the trial, probably about 50% of the people will have had a second episode of depression. So one third don't get well, and fully half, that response doesn't last. Right? So even in antidepressants, which we think of as something which we actually do fairly well in psychiatry, our treatments are of limited efficacy. Okay, 
So we have high burden diseases that we don't know how to describe, we don't know how to follow with biomarkers, and we can only treat half well. Why the heck would I want to go oversee the agency that's responsible for trying to improve the plight of individuals with psychiatric diseases? And so I want to follow up these challenges with what I see as the opportunities, and then you'll see how those opportunities impact my own work and then what I think of for the future. So what are the opportunities in psychiatry? The first one is genetics. Now, five years ago, if you'd asked me or probably anyone in this room that, about genetics as being an opportunity in psychiatry, you would have laughed me off the stage because we had really very few, if any, bona fide genes that we think predisposed to psychiatry. But now we have an embarrassment of riches. So on this plot is already now uh, three years old, um, 108 different loci in the genome, places in the genome, that if you have the wrong variant, the wrong sequence in that place, you have a higher risk of getting schizophrenia. So these are 108 different biological clues, right? Now, I'm not going to pretend that we know from those 108 clues exactly what's going on. In fact, trying to figure out what's going on is going to be really complicated. But we have 108 different places to look. And this is three years ago. At the World Conference of Psychiatric Genetics, I was privileged enough to attend about a month ago. They released the latest data set, 248 places in the genome to look. Right? So we have lots of biological clues from genetics. We also have a growing sophistication in our mathematical and theoretical approaches to understanding the brain that have the potential to really benefit psychiatry. So we have data mining approaches that allow us to combine massive data sets and really try to understand how the brain functions and how it goes wrong. We have increasingly sophisticated techniques to develop, to biophysically model how the brain works and to use those models to understand how genes affect circuits, how circuits affect behavior. Um, and we, in fact, can turn that um, to the behavioral area to really develop sophisticated ways of phenotyping individuals that get at actually the neural computations that circuits near, need to perform. So we can apply all these techniques to psychiatric problems and I think, anyway, make real headway in terms of understanding how the brain functions and how it goes awry in psychiatric disease. And then finally, in the last 10 years or so, neuroscientists have developed an array of techniques that give us the ability to look deeply into the function of neural circuits. So I've now said neural circuits, I don't know, five times or so already, so I should probably define what I mean. So this is a picture of a, a brain of a mouse, of a particular part of the brain called the hippocampus. And what you can see is lots of different colored little round blobs. Each one of those is a cell. It's a neuron within the brain. And each one of them actually has been colored a slightly different color using a, uh, a wonderful technique developed by investigators at Harvard University. And what you can see is there's lots of different neurons in this one chunk of brain. What you can't see from that is that the neuron that is defined by one color as compared to another is wired up to a number of its neighbors, both in this brain structure and in other brain structures to which it's connected. So those groups, small groups of neurons that are wired together, communicate with each other and, in, and perform calculations, computations that the brain needs to do to produce behavior. So for example, there is a circuit of neurons in my motor cortex that are performing the calculation needed to know how far I need to move my arm to emphasize a point. Probably much further than I actually need, to actually much less far than I need to, than I actually do, but so, the brain is, different circuits in the brain are, are constantly performing these computations. And we've now developed, as you can tell by these labeling techniques, we can label specific neurons with specific colors. We can also take those neurons and put genes into them that allow us to manipulate those neurons in very specific ways, as I'll show you in the rest of the talk. So the, this tremendous power to be able to observe and manipulate specific elements of specific circuits in the brain allow us to really start breaking down how the brain performs these computations to guide behavior. And potentially, as I'll talk in the latter part of my talk, to intervene in those circuits when they break down to try to develop uh, technique tools to, to, to help with uh, psychiatric illness. So those uh, four challenges, burden, uh, uh, poor diagnoses, biomarker, lack of biomarkers, um, and, and uh, mediocre treatments can be met, I hope anyway, uh, by these opportunities that we have from genetics, uh, from computational neuroscience, and from neural circuit uh, technologies.
So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus really on the neural circuit technology piece, although there's a little bit of genetics in there, too, um, to tell you about my own work and then I th hopefully uh, how we can use that work in a translational fashion in the future. So story one, from gene to behavior through the circuit. So if we have a gene that predisposes to a psychiatric illness, how do we understand the role of that gene in the psychiatric symptoms? Well, genes don't code for behaviors. They code for proteins. And those proteins are expressed in cells, the major cell of the nervous system being the neuron, although there are other ones too. I'm going to ignore them for now, and you can yell at me for doing that later. Those neurons form circuits. Those circuits, as I said before, perform computations that, are, are, that help the brain guide behavior. Those circuits actually wire up into whole complex neural systems that actually guide behavior. So I would argue, as many others have before me, that in order to understand how a gene causes a psychiatric illness relevant behavior, one needs to understand the effects of that gene at the level of the cell, the level of the circuit, and the level of the system to describe the full course of events leading from gene to behavior. There's one other reason why it's important to be able to describe it across multiple levels of the nervous system, gene, cell, circuit system, and that's because in psychiatry especially, we don't know what level is going to be the best to intervene to treat our illnesses. So antidepressants, they work sort of at the level of the cell, right? They affect receptors on the surface of the cell membrane, or they affect transporters that move things in and out of the cell. But Cognitive behavioral therapy, that works at the level of behavior, right? This is a behavioral intervention that changes the brain and helps people with depression. Deep brain stimulation, a technique under study right now for depression that shows promising results, is a systems level technology. You implant an electrode and try to activate or inhibit, we don't even really know which one, the whole brain system to try to help people with depression. So we can imagine that intervening at multiple different levels might be able to help our patients. So we really need to understand the full panoply. So we set out to do that in, in my lab by studying a gene, a particular gene called the 22Q11 microdeletion. It's actually not one gene. It's 20 different genes on human chromosome 22 that, um, that tend to be deleted together in about one in 4,000 live births. The microdeletion is associated with schizophrenia and actually with autism, too. If you have this microdeletion, you have about a 35 40% chance of having a psychotic disorder uh, that develops in early adulthood, just like schizophrenia does, and has many of the features of schizophrenia caused by presumably other causes. The nice thing about this microdeletion, from my perspective, is that collaborators of mine, Joseph Gogos and Mary Koryorgu, had made a mouse that's missing the same panoply of genes, but from mouse chromosome 16 instead of mouse chromosome 22. We set out to understand how the microdeletion um, might affect behaviors of relevance to, to schizophrenia. Now, it's really hard to know when a mouse is hallucinating. So rather than studying the psychosis, we studied the cognitive phenotypes that are consequent to the microdeletion. So how do we study cognition in a mouse? So we chose to study working memory, which is a phenotype which is uh, disrupted in patients with schizophrenia and, by the way, in patients with this microdeletion who don't have psychosis um, or, and who do have psychosis. How do we study working memory in a mouse? We use what's called a spatial task of working memory. It's a very simple test. You put the animal in a T-shaped maze. It runs down the center of that maze. During the sample phase, there's a wall blocking off one of the two arms of the T-maze. The animal then retrieves a reward from the open arm, goes back to the center, and after a delay, during the choice phase, it's faced with a choice. Do I go right or go left? And it has to remember the relatively simple rule. Wherever you went during the sample phase, go to the opposite arm. So that's called a T-maze delayed non matched to sample test of spatial working memory, a mouthful, to use Kim's words. Mice that are missing this chunk of their chromosome 16 take longer to learn the task than their wild-type littermates. And on average, they take about two days longer at 10 trials a day for the aficionados to acquire this task of spatial working memory. And so that then gives us a, uh, a, a path to follow from gene to behavior. It's not schizophrenia, right? It's the microdeletion as modeled in a mouse. And it's not all the various phenotypes of schizophrenia. It's a reduced problem, a much reduced problem. How does microdeletion of this segment of chromosome 16 affect behavior in this working memory task? But it gives us the opportunity with a reduced problem to study the specific elements along the multiple areas of the nervous system.
So we started for various reasons at the level of nervous, at the of level of the neural systems. We knew that two particular parts of the brain, the hippocampus, which is important for memory, and the prefrontal cortex, the, work, the medial prefrontal cortex, which in rodents anyway is important for decision making, have to work together to do this task. How do we know they work together? Well, we implant electrodes into these two parts of the brain, and we record neural activity from those two parts of the brain over time. And when you record neural activity, in particular from the hippocampus, this blue region, over time, that neural activity oscillates. All right? So this is the local field potential. It's a measure of activity that sums up the activity of many neurons, actually many synapses within the hippocampus. And uh, the activity in the hippocampus is going up and down and up and down and up and down over multiple frequency ranges. The most prominent is this theta frequency range illustrated here with the purple dotted line, and that up and down, you can tell by the scale bar that's now on the screen, is going up and down about eight times a second. That's called the theta frequency oscillation. So I might say theta, or I might say eight hertz, or I might say oscillation, but it's this up and down in the hippocampus over time. Now, at the same time we record activity in the hippocampus, we're also recording the activity of single neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And those neurons are firing action potentials, illustrated here by straight lines. And what you can sort of see is that those action potentials in the prefrontal cortex seem to be occurring in rhythm with the oscillation in the hippocampus. So, and in fact, it seems to occur on the upswing of activity in the hippocampus. Whenever there's an upswing, you see a spike or two in the prefrontal cortical neuron. So we say that this medial prefrontal cortical neuron seems to be phase-locked because it's, it's being active at particular phases of the hippocampal theta oscillation. And we can use this phase locking measure to figure out what happens during behavior. Is that phase locking getting stronger or weaker? So here is that same neuron that I illustrated up here, um, but lots and lots of spikes from that neuron, lots and lots of action potentials. And what you can see is that it, those spikes are counted by according to which phase of the theta cycle they are on. And most of those neurons are around 90 degrees of phase, which are on the Gibby upswing of each of the theta oscillations. And if we record lots of neurons in the prefrontal cortex, about 60% of prefrontal cortical neurons are phase locked to the theta, the theta oscillation in the hippocampus. These are two brain regions that in a mouse brain, they're pretty far apart, at least by mouse brain standards. They're like a centimeter, centimeter and a half apart from each other. So how can activity be going up and down in time together in these two brain regions? They must be connected and or talking to each other uh, for this to happen. And uh, be, so we infer, and later on I'll demonstrate, that it's due to the connections between them that they can phase lock. What happens to that phase locking now when you put the animal in a working memory task? In wild type animals, you get a certain amount of phase locking, a strength of phase locking of 0.08, a meaningless number. But the important thing is that in our mutant animals performing the same task, they don't phase lock as well. The phase locking is weaker. And that's true no matter which phase of the task the animals are in. So it suggests the following hypothesis that these two brain regions can't talk to each other well. And the, reason why they, and the reason why they can't do the working memory task might be that they can't talk to each other. So how do we test that hypothesis? We move now down to the circuit element area, and we ask, well, how do these two brain regions talk to each other normally? And the hypothesis is that the hippocampus sends information to the prefrontal cortex by way of the axons that go from one brain region to the other. So now we can use a circuit level technique to try to disrupt the function of these axons and see if that disrupts behavior. So we're gonna leave behind the mutants for a while and we're gonna study only wild type mice and we're gonna ask in wild type mice, do you need this connection between your hippocampus and prefrontal cortex to do working memory behavior properly? How do we test that? We put a virus into the hippocampus that expresses enhanced ARCH 3.0. That's a bacterial protein. So it's a protein that's not normally in mice normally in bacteria, we can express it in these specific neurons in the hippocampus that project to the prefrontal cortex. And when that protein is expressed in those neurons and you shine a light onto those neurons, that protein becomes activated, pumps protons out of the neurons, making those neurons less active. So you inhibit those neurons. And uh, this is the protein now expressed, not actually in the neurons in the hippocampus, but in the, their axons within the prefrontal cortex. 
So we can also shine light not on the neurons themselves, but only on their axons, inhibiting those axons and preventing them from sending information from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. So we use this very specific circuit manipulation, turn off the projection from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. I'm not going to show you the data that it actually works. You trust me that it does. And we disrupt behavior in the working memory task. So here is an, a wild type animal performing normally at about 80% correct. So it gets about 80% of those trials right, where it has to remember where it was and go the opposite arm. If animals not expressing our bacterial protein, we turn on a light in the prefrontal cortex. We don't do anything to the axons, and the animals perform, continue to perform well. If, however, the mice are expressing our inhibitory protein in the axons that project into the prefrontal cortex, we turn on the light and we reduce performance to about 65%. We impair the animal's ability to do this working memory task. So this tells us that these axons that send information from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex are indeed important for working memory. So now we have two steps of the process. We know that the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are disconnected and are mutant. And we know that if we artificially disconnect them by inhibiting the projection from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, we get the same behavioral phenotype or similar behavioral phenotype as is present in the mutants. So now we just need one more thing. We need to know why this gene mutation causes deficits in this connection between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. And, um, and it turns out um, my collaborator, Joseph Kogus, in his lab discovered why. So these are our mutant animals. These are neurons taken from our mutant animals and grown in a dish. Okay? And Looking at their axons, at the projections that they send out grown in a dish, you can see that the mutant animals have impoverished branches compared to the wild-type animals. See, lots more branches in wild-type animals than in mutant neurons. Okay, So there's something about the neurons where they don't grow out properly their axons. And this is true not just for generic neurons grown in a dish, but also for those very same hippocampal to prefrontal projection neurons. The axons that grow out from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex do not grow out as well. Why is this happening? Well, it turns out this one gene within this 22q11 microdeletion called ZDHHC8, it changes the proteins in the developing axon so that you get a dysregulation of a kinase called GSK3. We know that because Jun Mukai, the postdoc in Joseph's lab, cut up those axons, ground them up, and looked at the biochemistries and found that one of the consequences of this microdeletion, as well as deleting just this one gene, was to have a hyperactive protein kinase GSK3. So to prove that that was the case, he then used an antagonist to that hyperactive protein kinase and restored normal branching patterns in our mutants. So here's our mutants with their impoverished branching. Treat those neurons in a dish with our antagonist, and you get normal branching. You reverse the deficits. And again, this was true not just in neurons in a dish, but also in neurons in the intact animal. If you treated the animals while they were growing up from, the, from uh, when they were born to postnatal day 28, you restored normal branching of axons in vivo as well. So that led to a hypothesis that leads all the way from gene to behavior. You have a microdeletion. As a result, you have messed up biochemistry, in particular dysregulation of a kinase that creates axonal branching deficits in the hippocampal to prefrontal projection, meaning that the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex can't synchronize, and that's why they can't do the working memory test. That's the hypothesis. We did one more test to try to gather additional evidence. We took our mice, our 22Q11 microdeletion mice, and we treated them with GSK3 beta to try to restore the axonal branches and asked what effect did that have on behavior and on synchrony between the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. So this is now work done in my lab by Makoto Tamura, a porn postdoc. He treated animals daily with our antagonist to GSK3, waited three months for them to grow up, implanted them with electrodes, put them through the T maze. Here's our behavior result. Wild-type animals learn the maze task in four days. Mutants, they take two days longer. Drug-treated animals, they rescue. They go down to four days. Here's our measure of neural synchrony, of phase locking. Um, stronger in wild types than in mutants, rescued by the drug. So this is at least confirmatory evidence that we can trace a series of events leading from 
a particular genetic deficit, loss of this region of chromosome 16 in a mouse, through axonal branching deficits, deficits at the circuit in terms of the ability of hippocampus to send prefrontal cortex information, desynchronizing these two structures that normally have to work together, resulting in working memory behavior. So the reason why I wanted to tell you this story is I think it's a nice example of how we need to go after genetics, how we can use genetic clues to try to understand what's going on in, um, in our patients, what's going wrong with phenotypes at the level of behavior um, across multiple, system, multiple levels of the nervous system. That said, before I move on to story two, I want to say that this is a dramatic oversimplification of the system in schizophrenia. First of all, it's even a dramatic oversimplification of 22Q11 patients. Forget the rest of schizophrenia, right? This is a mouse model. You're focusing on one very specific behavior, one particular part of the brain. And although we think we can explain the behavior results in a mouse, how much relevance that will have to the much more complex picture in a human, even in working memory in a human, we don't know. How much relevance does that have to the other cognitive deficits in patients with 22Q or even less so? The psychosis that we see in 22Q, we don't know. But it's a nice, satisfying example how it goes, one goes from gene to behavior. And then, of course, in generic schizophrenia, that is in the global picture of schizophrenia, just like you all know in autism, the, excuse me, the genetic picture is much more complex. Most genes that raise your risk for schizophrenia raise your risk only slightly, so not 30-fold like 22Q, but 1.2-fold, right? And so it's a combination, combinatorial action of lots of genes that raise your risk for schizophrenia for most individuals with the disorder. And how to do that, how to study that at this kind of level is really unclear right now. So we still face challenges using genetic information, but I want to give you an example of what can work when it is at least simplified. Okay, story number two. So if story number one showed you how we can learn, how we can link genes to behavior through circuits, story number two delves more deeply into the circuit to try to understand what's going on in the circuit that actually generates psychiatrically relevant behaviors. And, um, and the, as I said before, what, what, the point of this story is to tell you that the dynamics, how things change over time, matter. So early on, when I was a faculty member, actually my first graduate student, Avishek Adhikari, who's now down at UCLA in a faculty position, um, built on some work I'd done my, during my postdoc to show that these same two brain regions, the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, they don't only work together during working memory, they also work together during particular kinds of anxiety-related tasks called conflict avoidance tasks. So we take a mouse and we put it in a particular maze called the elevated plus maze. Mice will naturally avoid the open arms of the plus maze and spend most of their time in the closed arms, presumably because for a mouse, you're safer in enclosed dark spaces than out in the open where a hawk could swoop down and eat you for lunch. So um, mice will avoid those open parts and, uh, and spend most of the time in the closed arms. And for various reasons, we think that is relevant to certain kinds of human anxiety. Um, I can tell you lots of information, but the shortest thing I can say is that drugs which increase anxiety, uh, increase the amount of time the animals will spend in those closed arms relative to the open, and drugs that decrease anxiety uh, it decrease the amount of times the animals will spend in the closed arms. They'll spend more time exploring the open arms. There's lots of other reasons as to why we think it's behavior relevant, but we'll leave it at that for now. And if we record activity from neurons in the prefrontal cortex and from the local field potential in the hippocampus, you can see for any one neuron, this is one neuron, that there is, again, a temporal relationship. There's phase locking of the prefrontal cortical neuron to the hippocampal theta oscillation. And if we take that animal in a familiar environment and move it to the plus maze, that phase locking gets stronger on average by about 20%, okay? So these two structures, they don't just interact during working memory, they also interact during, uh, during anxiety. And to prove that that interaction is causal, that it actually causes anxiety-relevant behavior, we did the same technique that I told you about before. We put our inhibitory bacterial protein into the hippocampus, shined light in the prefrontal cortex, disconnecting the two structures. And what happens during anxiety? Well, um, well actually, what happens first to phase locking, right? So this is the phase locking strength with the light on, phase locking strength with the light off. Each dot here is one neuron in the prefrontal cortex. And what you can see is that the neurons lie mostly below this line. That is, most of the neurons decrease their phase locking when you turn the light on. 
So turning the light on here, I'm showing you what I didn't show you before. Turning the light on does disconnect the hippocampus from the prefrontal cortex. What happens behaviorally? Here's the amount of time the animal spends in the open arms. We turn on the light in animals expressing the opsin, not in animals that don't express this bacterial protein. And the animals will spend more of their time in the open arms. That is, turning off this circuit decreases anxiety-like behavior. It increases exploration of the frightening open arms. And it's reversible. You can turn the light off again, then turn it back on, and you get the effect. So this particular circuit, the hippocampal to prefrontal circuit, is important not just for working memory, but also for anxiety-like behavior. And, um, and you get that same kind of synchrony, that theta frequency synchrony in this circuit during anxiety. So Nancy Padilla, another graduate student in the lab, decided that she wanted to test whether that theta oscillation is actually important or whether it's just a signal of the de degree to which these two structures are communicating. So instead of inhibiting, she chose to excite these hippocampal inputs into the prefrontal cortex. And she chose to excite those inputs in three different temporally, temporally different patterns. So one was sort of mimic the natural oscillation that happens in the hippocampus eight times a second. Another one was using the same frequency, but stimulating all of the inputs at once with a big pulse every eight times a second. So the difference between these two is the pattern. And then a third way, a, an oscillation like the eight hertz one, up and down and up and down and up and down, but 20 times a second instead of eight times a second. The main thing she wanted to test was whether there was something special about this oscillation and then also something special about the frequency. So she chose these three patterns, put them on or off, uh, two minute exposures in the elevated plus maze, and found that, first of all, stimulation had the opposite effect of inhibition. Right? And so that's shown here of the 8 hertz sine wave. You turn on the light, the 8 hertz sine wave, exciting these inputs, and you reduce the amount of time spent in the open arms. So activating this pathway does indeed increase anxiety, just the opposite of inhibiting the pathway, which decreased anxiety. But it mattered which pattern she gave to these axons. Only the 8 hertz oscillation, not pulses delivered 8 times a second, or a faster 20 hertz oscillation, increased anxiety-like behavior. So there's something actually special about 8 hertz and about this oscillatory pattern. Why? Well, she then worked with Sarah Canetta, a postdoc in Christoph Kellendonk's lab, to record from medial prefrontal cortical neurons um, while stimulating the hippocampal inputs in a slice so that she could figure out what's actually going on. And 8 hertz pulses, by activating all these hippocampal inputs all at once, resulted in strong postsynaptic responses in the prefrontal cortical neuron to each of the pulses. 20 hertz pulses, by the way, seem too fast to drive the synapse. So already we're seeing something special about 8 hertz in this circuit. That is that the circuit is designed to uh, transmit information at 8 times a second, not 20 times a second. What about the sine wave? The sine wave didn't evoke these strong responses to each of the waves. Um, neither did the 20 hertz sine wave, but it did increase the rate of weaker, spontaneous-like excitatory postsynaptic currents in these prefrontal cortical neurons that were glutamate dependent, because if we use glutamatergic blockers, you block all of those events. So first, the synapse, hippocampal to prefrontal synapse, seems to be specialized for the 8 hertz input, which is the kind of input you'd expect to get from the hippocampus. Second, simultaneously activating them all drives that synapse very well. Activating it with this sine wave, which mimics the natural oscillatory pattern, doesn't result in strong postsynaptic responses, but somehow seems to increase the excitability of these synapses. And to tell that story directly, Nancy tested that hypothesis directly by stimulating the hippocampal inputs in an intact animal and recording the responses of prefrontal cortical neurons in the presence or absence of these different kinds of illumination, and asked, what does the sine wave do to the ability of the hippocampus to drive the prefrontal cortical neurons? Uh, this is the prefrontal cortical neurons response to a pulse of electricity delivered to the hippocampus, right? So this is the hippocampal input. You get a response to the prefrontal cortical neuron. If you do it while the light is on, oscillating eight times a second, you get a bigger response. 
So shining this oscillatory light onto the terminals increased the ability of those terminals to actually transmit information from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. And it did it best at 8 hertz, weaker at 20 hertz, and the pulses had no effect. And it required the bacterial protein that allows you to activate those neurons, chan channel rhodopsin 2. So turning on an oscillatory stimulus doesn't drive the synapse itself, but it potentiates the ability of that synapse to carry out its information transmission role. It does so, though, in a really interesting way, which is it's not acting by itself all the time at maximal efficiency. It must be coupling with something going on in the brain of the animal separately. Why do I say that? This is the, OK, so we have our optical stimulus that's oscillating along at 8 hertz or at 20 hertz. And um, we can forget the stimulation now. We can just record prefrontal cortical neurons. And because that oscillatory stimulus, though, is potentiating the ability of information to flow through the system, you now get phase locking of prefrontal cortical neurons, not to the hippocampal theta oscillation, but to the optical oscillation in the laser itself. So we get artificial phase locking of prefrontal cortical neurons to this optical stimulus, both at 8 hertz and weaker at 20 hertz. This is in a familiar environment. Now we take the animal and we put it in the plus maze. And we get a, a huge increase, something like threefold increase, in the strength of phase locking of prefrontal cortical neurons to the optical stimulus, only at a hertz, not at 20 hertz. So on the one hand, this synapse seems specialized to receive 8 hertz information. On the other hand, there's an interaction with some other signal going on in the mouse when the mouse is in an anxiety-provoking environment that results in even more synchrony in this theta range, in this 8 hertz range. There's one more piece to it, um, which is that we found that not only did the medial prefrontal cortical neurons phase lock to the optical oscillation that we were shining into the prefrontal cortex, exciting those hippocampal inputs, but we also saw phase locking back in the hippocampus. So here is our optical oscillation induced in our laser. And here is the local field potential in the hippocampus. And you can see they kind of line up. And you can see that with a measure called coherence at 8 hertz. So this is an animal without our opsin. This is an animal with the opsin. Turn, actually, it's all the animals. And you can see that over the about 5 or 10 seconds, you get the emergence of uh, synchrony between the optical oscillation and the hippocampal local field potential. Um, it takes five seconds to emerge, which to us says that it's not back propagation. We're not directly activating the hippocampus because we're activating the terminals. We think we're doing it indirectly. Um, and the final result of that means that the prefrontal cortical neurons that are phase locked to the optical oscillation are also now phase locked more strongly to the hippocampus as well. So we get multiple effects with our dynamic modulation. When we stimulate this input at eight times a second, we get better information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, number one. Number two, we get interaction with something going on endogenously in the animal, we think maybe it's serotonin, that potentiates this frequency-specific transmission of information from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. And number three, we think we get a, a back projection somehow, probably through an intermediate area, to the hippocampus that results in the hippocampal activity now being timed to the optical oscillation. So we get the entire circuit reverberating in an oscillation that's unnatural, our 8 hertz oscillation, that facilitates information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, resulting in increased anxiety-like avoidance. All right, so the, again, the main message now here is that the dynamics matter. We can stimulate this pathway with a range of different stimuli, but only the one that harnesses its natural pattern of activity, that in, indeed induces a reverberant loop in the pathway, where we get maximal activation of the circuit, maximal information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, maximal anxiety-like avoidance. All right, so I told you two stories that try to address what I think are particularly opportunities in circuit neuroscience that we can use 
to affect our understanding of uh, psychiatrically relevant behaviors. In story number one, I told you how we can use circuit techniques to link genetic predisposition to behaviors of relevance to that genetic predisposition. In story number two, I told you how we can interrogate a circuit, try to understand, number one, what patterns of activity are naturally present in that circuit, number two, interrupt or mimic those patterns of activity, and what we can learn from that is that the dynamics of activity in a circuit actually matter for behavior. <coughs> so for most of my career, that's all I cared about. I cared about trying to understand the nervous system in systems of relevance to psychiatric disease, but you know, let's be honest, it's not a whole lot translational in what I already told you. So how might we, and now we, I can say we, meaning the NIMH, foster the kinds of studies that will result in moving this information from being scientific curiosities or increased pure understanding of brain function and dysfunction towards things that would actually make a difference for our patients. And so I want to talk briefly to you now about how we can use this information towards translation. How might we push uh, neuroscience toward, uh, circuit neuroscience towards translation? And there's two basic ways. One I call the neurobiologic approach, and the other I call the technological approach. So what is the neurobiologic approach? So I have on here two different types of neurons labeled with two different colors. Right? Let's for a moment say that the green neurons are the neurons in the hippocampus that project to the prefrontal cortex. And the red neurons are neurons in the hippocampus that don't. They are not, by the way, these are not hippocampal neurons. Those of you who know hippocampus know that they're not hippocampal neurons, but let me go with it for a while. <laughs> Imagine that I had the capacity in a human being to activate or inhibit these hippocampal neurons. And I could do it at that eight hertz frequency. Maybe I'd want to activate the eight hertz frequency in patients with working memory disruption because of 22Q11 microdeletion to try to strengthen connectivity to the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Or maybe I'd want to inhibit those neurons to reduce anxiety in patients with hyperactivity in the circuit with anxiety disorders. <coughs> How might I do that? Well, there's a neurobiologic way and there's a technological way. The neurobiologic way is to understand everything I can about those neurons to figure out what makes those neurons oscillate at eight hertz. What makes that synapse specialized for transmission at eight hertz? And might that then give me the ability to find a drug that blocks those particular characteristics of those hippocampal neurons that prevents them or enhances their ability to work at eight hertz to try to modulate that behavior? So that requires delving into the biological characteristics of specific circuit elements what makes that hippocampal neuron a hippocampal neuron? What makes that hippocampal to prefrontal synapse specialized for eight hertz? We need to find, find the molecular elements that might be specifically expressed in that circuit, or the physiological and anatomical characteristics, that eight hertz oscillation, et cetera, that would allow me to target that circuit specifically with an intervention. So maybe it's a drug that affects an ion channel that um, affects the ability of synaptic transmission to happen at eight hertz specifically, or maybe it's a transcranial magnetic stimulation that's going to affect the anatomical inputs and uh, we can stimulate at eight hertz or at some other frequency that affects eight hertz neurotransmission so that we could get some specificity, specificity to our manipulation. This requires purposeful examination of these specific circuit elements, something that we in circuit neuroscience don't do a lot of. We're happy enough to do what I just told you. Oh, this circuit element is important for anxiety, and then move on to the next circuit element, or move on to the next process that we're interested in. We have to, circuit neuroscientists have become molecular biologists. We have to become biochemists. We have to try to delve deeper into these circuit elements to figure out what we might manipulate. That's the neurobiologic approach. The technological approach would allow us to be, continue to be circuit neuroscientists, but now require that we actually become human circuit neuroscientists. We have to be able to define the circuit elements in human beings that are important for these circuits, for these behavioral functions. We have to develop the technologies that will allow us not to label up hippocampal neurons in a mouse, but a hippocampal neurons in a human being, and figure out how we determine what modulation we need to do, and do it all in a way that would minimize invasiveness. Now, in a mouse, there's so many invasive things I can't even tell you that we did to do this. We had Cree-dependent mouse lines, right? Cree mouse lines that allow us to direct expression to specific circuit elements. We're not going to breed Cree-expressing human beings. We're just not going to do it. 
Um, and we injected things into particular parts of the brain. And so we can imagine, uh, uh, but more, much more likely, the first thing that I have to tell you about a mouse is this is not the relative size of a mouse in human brain. This is the relevant size of a human mouse brain. Now, I, the other thing I didn't tell you is to label up the entire hippocampus, we did 12 injections per side in our mouse. It might have been overkill. We might have been able to make do with six per side, but it's still a lot. Now imagine we want to fill the hippocampus of a human being. We need whole different um, delivery techniques that will allow us to infect larger chunks of tissue. So just size. Then, of course, there's the complexity of important parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, which are way oversimplified in a mouse. So for that, we need intermediate models, like non-human primates, that will allow us to identify circuit elements that might translate better to humans, that will allow us to test techniques that would infect larger chunks of tissue, or infect neurons that are not even present in a mouse, but might be present in a human. Um, then, of course, we need to direct specific expressions without Cree lines. We can use enhancers packaged into viruses that we might inject into the brain. But wouldn't it be better if we could do it non-invasively? So we would like to develop means of packaging things into viruses or other delivery systems that we could inject into the bloodstream that would find their way into the brain and then deliver specific expression in tissue-specific elements. So that's the dream. And I think if we really want to achieve our mission of uh, paving the way to prevention, recovery, and cure, we can hope to do it with the traditional psychosocial interventions, uh, activity-dependent modulation we can do in non-invasively, and uh, pharmaceutical drugs right? that might target specific elements. We can hope that the neurobiologic approach would work. But I would argue that while we're trying to figure out the neurobiologic approach to manipulate circuits specifically, we might also need to develop these technologies further so that we can imagine using them in humans one day. Unless you think, oh, are people really going to want to undergo brain surgery and implantation of foreign proteins into their brain to help solve their psychiatric problems? Come on. Just think about the number of people who are lined up to try to get deep brain stimulation for OCD or DBS for depression. Think about the one-third of patients who aren't helped with our treatment. Some large fraction of them are devastated by their illness and would grasp at any straw. And think about actually the relative safety of these neurosurgical interventions. And one might think, you know what, there would be a demand for this, especially if we could minimize the invasiveness and make it more routine and safe. So I think we need to plan for that day in the future, even if hopefully we never have to get there and we can use the neurobiologic approach more specifically. So thanks for listening. I appreciate your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Hi, so as a totally non-neuroscientist, immunologist, but I was thinking just a bigger picture. Do you think um, the same type of thing would be for, for people who are refractory to ep epilepsy treatments and sort of that that might be an obvious sort of place since they go in and ablate areas of the brain anyway? Yeah, in fact, epilepsy is one of the, probably a, uh, an application that might be uh, closer to trying to use these circuit level techniques. Um, so folks are already identifying, using various technologies, the foci of epilepsy and trying to online detect the emergence of a seizure and interrupt it, predominantly electrically right now. But it might be much more effective if you can infect those neurons with an inhibitory uh, opsin, for example, or an inhibitory chemogenetic module that allows you with a drug to inhibit it, detect them and release that event, uh, prevent that event online um, with an invasive technology. So that's already sort of under at least construction right now for epilepsy. Another area where um, invasive genetic uh, uh, techniques is, uh, is pretty much right around the corner is in Parkinson's disease. Um, people are really interested in trying to intervene in Parkinson's disease with um, gene therapies. And, uh, and, and there are others as well. So there are already folks who are actually conducting CNS clinical trials with the introduction of foreign proteins. They're, they're different than the kinds of technologies we've, we've been working with in mice. Um, but the, the technologies are being developed for other purposes in addition to psychiatric disorders. Hi, Josh. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank Thanks. you very much for delivering it. Uh, it really raised lots of questions, but I wanted to ask you one. Um, in your studies on the, the mouse 22Q11 uh, series of studies, I wonder, in your thinking, how do you go from those mouse findings to the, to the human, and what kind of validation do you need to, to, to sort of convince you 
that the same kind of phenomena happening in the human brain before you actually try and go to mouse-derived treatments? Yeah, so that's a really great question, because theoretically we have a, a treatment that we could potentially offer right now. So what would give you the confidence to want to try that in a human being? Um, so first and foremost, we need to de-oversimplify, right? We need to try to understand, well, how much of the um, phenomenology underlying 22Q might be due to things like axon outgrowth or developmental processes that are dysregulated because of GSK3 hyperactivity. Um, as, a, as one start for that, there are now folks who've done really uh, nice connectivity imaging in patients with 22Q. And they do find deficits in hippocampal prefrontal connectivity. But intriguingly, they find hyperconnectivity between, say, thalamus and primary sensory regions. So there are, so the situation is more complex. It's probably not pure hypoconnectivity. I also glossed over one other point, which is that we think the hypoconnectivity that we see in a mouse is pretty much universal through at least the two or three different connections that we've looked at, and also using a DTI study in the same mice. So the mouse picture may not reflect the complexity of the human picture. So, but, but that's the first step, is trying to figure out, is connectivity decreased? We can also grow 22Q11 neurons in dishes. That's being done. And one can ask, do we see the axon outgrowth or neurite outgrowth deficits that you see in a mouse? And can we reverse that with the, with the, with the drug? And then the, if, you, if all those things happen, then that gives you a little bit of confidence that you know, it's worth trying it. There are drugs on the market right now that have some GSK3 uh, antagonism cap capacity, including pretty innocuous drugs from the perspective of at least postnatal development. I wouldn't say purely innocuous, but uh, SSRIs, for example, um, that's one thing. Uh, lithium is also thought to inhibit GSK3. So there are drugs that are already out there that are used for other purposes that we might think of testing. Um, I wouldn't recommend it right now, but I would say, you know, first we need to show that the phenomenon that we can observe in a mouse that we could replicate in a human actually take place, and that they're reversible using a drug sort of in a dish as opposed to in a human being. Those are two steps along the way. Probably lot, lots more, but those are two. I want to ask you everything from the nerdy little stuff to the big picture stuff, but maybe I'll go intermediate. So following up on David's question, you know, in humans, we actually have some evidence for theta oscillations being disrupted in schizophrenia too. But are theta oscillations around six hertz and probably generated in medial prefrontal cortex. And I was wondering if you have any late, have any more recent thoughts since the last time we talked about it, about how homolo, and you know, you have species like bats, which may not even have normal theta oscillations. How much can we say a human theta oscillation is like a rat and is even related to the circuit per se? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, I haven't seen the data yet, but someone told me they actually looked in anxiety patients at invoked anxiety and see enhancements in that frontal midline theta that I know you're referring to, which suggests that maybe theta is at least involved in the anxiety side. Um, the frequency of theta in a rodent depends a lot upon what they're actually doing. And so a human in stationary in an EEG recording having a six hertz theta is not that unlike when we see hippocampal theta in a stationary rodent, it tends to be lower frequencies, usually around five hertz. Um, so it may depend upon the behavioral condition. It may actually be the same thing. If it's really derived from prefrontal cortex and not from hippocampus, um, we are, uh, a former postdoc in my lab, Katya Lichtig, is trying to look into what drives prefrontal theta separate from hippocampal theta. And it's, it seems to be, um, in her preliminary experiments from, yes, the basal forebrain cholinergic nuclei, which the, you know, the medial septum drives hippocampal theta, um, it, but the diagonal band more and further out uh, laterally than the medial septum. And that provides input to the prefrontal cortex. And when she, in some preliminary experiments, has inhibited those nuclei, she disrupts theta in the prefrontal cortex. So it may be that that is what's governing prefrontal theta as opposed to hippocampal theta. They synchronize up during certain behaviors, but they may have different generators. So Josh, I was wondering if you think that the circuit that you're modulating is involved in completely different behavioral phenotypes, you know, one anxiety and one uh, co cognition, or whether you think there's a single kind of un underlying computational process, like maintaining a goal in mind, um, that in one context would have you, would support behaviors 
go, go down this uh, uh, arm that I haven't been before so I can get rewarded and in another behavior, I stay inside so you don't get eaten by a hawk. Right. So we have conflicting data on that. On the one hand, it, what we do know is that disrupting hippocampal to prefrontal input in both behaviors disrupts the spatial representations of the mazes in the two different tasks. So on the one hand, that hippocampal to prefrontal input is carrying some information that the prefrontal cortex uses to construct a local map of the environment. It's not the kind of map you see in the hippocampus that's pure space. It's a goal-directed map so that we don't find place fields in the prefrontal cortex. We find representations of the goal arm, representations of the open arm. And in both tasks, you disrupt the hippocampal input, you disrupt that spatial representation. So on the one hand, you might think, oh, it's doing the same thing. It's allowing the prefrontal cortex to create a spatial map of the task. On the other hand, um, where we've looked at it carefully in the, in the, in the, hip, in the anxiety uh, task, it's not actually the spatial location of the animal in the moment. It seems to be the spatial location of the animal about two seconds in the future. So in our interpretation of that for various reasons is that it's, uh, it's the animal sort of um, deciding to go or not to go into that open arm. And, and we could be wrong, but that's our interpretation. I'm not sure how that would translate into the working memory maze where we haven't been able to dissect what the animal's doing at the same time. So it's something to do with spatial representation, yes, but what exactly besides you know, representing task, informa task spatial information it is, it may be more complicated than that. With regard to holding the goal in mind or holding a rule in mind, we think that's actually for various reasons uh, um, uh, through a collaboration with Christoph Kalantok, we think that's thalamus. Thalamic input to the hippocamp, to the, to the prefrontal cortex seems to be important for remembering the rule and holding that, in, holding that rule in memory during the delay phase. So thank you so much for a, for a great talk and very exciting work. This is a, a question that sort of may sit intermediary between the, the hopeful future for human applications and whether or not current psychosocial and therapeutic interventions can be informed by the circuit level neuroscience that you're elucidating in the mouse. One can imagine that frame shifting in terms of things like another generation of cognitive behavior therapy, where the context in which you're in that would typically elicit um, an anxiety response can be reframed, even including the interoception of the experience of anxiety. Um, so do you see a, any kind of loop between the basic neuroscience and what we can deliver in terms of a kind of um, more informed or enlightened uh, psychotherapy? Yeah, so I, I think that's a wonderful opportunity to think more broadly than we can do in a mouse, although there's efforts to do things like that in mice. And, um, and think about how we might use the interactions between circuits and behavior to drive behavior in one direction or another. We could loosely, uh, one, ask, one, one example of that would be harnessing neuroplasticity, right, in the context of a particular behavior. There are some very gross attempts to do that right now. I say gross not meaning disgusting, but gross meaning not so fine-grained. So for example, trying to train people in a cognitive task while delivering transcranial direct current stimulation over the brain region that we think is important for that cognitive task to see if we can accentuate the, um, the efficacy of the, of the training to induce ch improvements in cognition. So one can imagine taking that analog and doing it, but with a more directed, fine-grained approach to try to stimulate, uh, let's say, you know, using the stuff I talked about, if we can enhance theta transmission during the training of a working memory task, Maybe we only need to do it during the training, and then the animals, or the humans, might be better at doing working memory tasks, or at least that working memory task, without the ongoing stimulation. So yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity to imagine interactions between um, circuit technologies and psychosocial interventions that would take advantage of things like plasticity. Uh, the, other, the other approach, though, is to think, to, is to, to, and this has already been done to a certain extent, or being tried to a certain extent, to use what we know about circuits to make sure 
that our psychosocial interventions are being delivered as effic efficaciously as possible. So for example, if what you're trying to do is improve cognitive control, um, then you want to make sure that when you're, in, and, and we think cognitive control, it's important to activate particular parts of the DLPFC, then we might use a circuit technique, a readout technique, either EEG or fMRI, to during the training to make sure that you're actually engaging the right part of your brain that needs to be fixed, and not other parts that might also play a role or compensate for deficits in that part, but you know, if you don't get it right, you're not actually fixing the underlying deficit. So one can imagine using circuit level techniques, particularly on the readout side, to enhance our ability to deliver uh, psychotherapeutic treatments. I had a really related question to that um, in regards to like um, treatment implications. So you had some really cool findings showing sort of acute effects uh, of the you know of the stimulation on the behaviors, is there any evidence to showing that like this kind of thing would help chronically like like you know because that's what you want to do in a patient you want to treat them and then have a help them throughout their their life, right? So we uh, tried early on rather than directly stimulating the hippocampal to prefrontal inputs, um, uh, you know, acutely in the moment to induce plasticity in that system to enhance neural transmission and uh, say you know increase the uh, 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 spatial working memory acquisition or something like that. Um, we haven't yet hit upon the right paradigm to induce the plasticity in that system yet, although we haven't exhaustively tried it. And that's something that, we, that I actually actively want to do in my lab at NIH, is focus on plasticity in the hippocampal prefrontal system to see if one can get long-lasting changes with a short-term manipulation, and whether that would rescue, say, cognitive deficits in our mice, in our mutant mice. So that's something we're actively interested in, but we haven't yet been able to engage in this particular circuit. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, so for polygenic disorders like schizophrenia or others that are very complicated and have many loci implicated, um, after we understand the, the role of each gene to connectivity, in particular brain regions of interest, what are your thoughts on going from um, understanding the various genes involved to kind of holistically being able to ex uh, explore the relative dosage of each gene. Yeah, so I think this is a problem which uh, on first glance seems almost, almost insurmountable. If you had took all the patients with schizophrenia in the world and, and tried to use them to look at, say, interactions between genes, you would not have enough statistical power. So you can't take the traditional genetic approaches to ask how these things interact. Um, at the same time, you think, oh, well, then let's take a candidate approach. Let's take two genes that we think should interact and test whether they do. Well, we've tried that in psychiatry for years. And we know that it leads down the, the rosy path of false positives. It's like, that's not going to move it. So, um, but increasingly, people are coming, people much more creative and smart than I am, are coming up with these really amazing ways to do high throughput neurobiology. And I think that's hopefully going to lead us towards a path where we can understand things. So, uh, so we could take the genes, and this has been done now already, right? We can ask using sort of, you know, um, data-driven approaches, where those genes tend to be expressed together. And you point out, oh, the cortex in postnatal development for schizophrenia cortex and prenatal development for autism, that gets you somewhere. Maybe it's excitatory neurons, maybe not. But it only, express, it only gives you the predominant, you know, the big signals and not the little signals. And we don't know whether the big signals are going to be more important, the more common signals are more important than the less common. But there are now approaches to be able to say, grow organoids in a dish that give you a diversity of cell types, just one method. And you can ask, what effect does genotype have on at least RNA expression phenotypes in lots and lots and lots of cell types all at once in, so, in a high throughput fashion that's so high throughput you can do thousands of experiments all at once. And it's the hope is that that might give us some power to understand what are common at phenotypes at the level of RNA expression. That then one can try to mimic using the less complicated, more straightforward approaches to you know, intervening at the level of a, a mouse so that we can figure out what are the circuit level consequences of those RNA expression phenotypes in the cell types that you've identified as being you know, 
affected by these genetic mutations. So that's one approach, but there's lots of other approaches that use other you know, techniques. Um, so that's one way to understand common variants. The other way is to say, forget common variants, because it's going to be too hard, and let's focus on the rare variants, like 22Q, and then take that back onto the common variants and ask, are they, are, is the neurobiology shared? There is some hope in that, because your likelihood to get psychosis with any given common variant is related to how much of the, sorry, your likelihood to get psychosis given any rare variant, like 22Q, is related to how much burden you have of common variation. In other words, it might be that these rare events of high penetrance like 22Q and the common variation that, that accounts for most of schizophrenia are working on the same neurobiologic substrates. And if that's the case, then it gives you hope by studying it in these easier to study systems, you will gain information that'll be relevant for the rest of, of schizophrenia as well. In autism, the story is a little bit less clear, but it seems like the burden of rare variants is stronger, so that might be the way we want to go. We might want to start with rare variants. On the other hand, pr you know, other people will tell you that the reason why rare variants look to play a greater role in autism is because that's where we've looked so far. Um, we don't have the 100,000 subject studies to do the common variation um, like we do in schizophrenia. So I think the jury's out, but you know, at NIMH, uh, we, have, we try to maintain a broad enough portfolio that we sort of try multiple attempts at it. So we have some really novel ways of looking at the effects of common variation and the complexities, and some other efforts at looking at these um, rare variants and trying to understand you know, their contributions and then see if it generalizes. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.